what I thought I'll talk about today is give you a sense of the guidance that I've had in how I've got into where I am now in my career path. I talk a lot, so next slide, please. So here are the tips for a successful academic career. I call them the Benga rules. These rules are just purely based on my experience of how I got to where I am today. Find passion in what you do. Be open-minded and flexible in your scientific journeys. Practice resilience. It is a crucial ingredient for managing failures. Forge collaborations outside your shop, your lab, or your group, because ultimately that will propel you in terms of your academic success. Know the rules of the game. This is my favorite. Getting tenured or being acclaimed in the work you do, for those not on the tenure track, requires you knowing the rules of the game. Understand the business of research. Most of us come into this with huge passion, but often we don't understand that it's a business. Um, they will tell you it's not a business, but it is a business. Next slide, please. Here's the remaining five rules. Invest in your career or self through self-learning. Refrain from thrashing your mentors because it's a small world out there. What goes around comes around. Very important. It's hard, but something we need to be able to do. I highlight this particular one because it's important. Strive to mentor others despite the demand on your time. It pays off in later years. Be brave. Don't be afraid to explore the opportunities. I did not say be bold, I said be brave. Because when you're brave, you can explore opportunities easily. Use your peers wisely. Peer mentoring works. So you're going to hear my story where each of these rules is going to actually be highlighted. And I weave that into that story of my own academic career. Next slide, please. So a brief account of my career. I went to medical school in the former Soviet Union in the Ukraine to be specific. I'm from Nigeria originally. Um, I returned home to Nigeria for my internship, spent a year in the National Service Corps, got my license, and then met my wife and then emigrated to the US in 1991. That's almost 30 years ago. I worked as a research assistant at Harlem Hospital, that's in New York City for two years before my residency. I never left New York, so I'm a diehard New Yorker. Next slide, please. Did my residency in the Northern aspect of New York, North Central Bronx, um, at Montefiore Medical Center, that's Albert Einstein. I did primary care. Upon completion of my residency, I was offered a chief resident position prior to a faculty appointment. I'd won the teaching award of the year as a resident, and I actually love to teach. So I went to my mentor and she advised me um, to do an MPH if I want to survive in academia because just teaching is not enough. This is the era of, we're talking about 1997, 1998, it's an era of evidence-based medicine. And so being academic meant you had to do research, but I didn't know that. I turned down the chief position and spent one year in a sickle cell research lab um, at one of the NIH funded centers in New York City, um, in, uh, in, at, at, at Montefiore. But I hated basic science, which is all we did. But I found solace in being the primary care doc for the sickle cell patients. I also enrolled in that year in an MPH program at Columbia University School of Public Health, with the thinking that if I did my MPH, I'll become a super researcher. So for me, somehow the MPH was supposed to be the way I become a scientist. Next slide, please. So after that, I actually, after the first year of my MPH, I actually fell in love with public health and epidemiology. And so I applied for, for a health services research fellowship at Cornell. I did two years of that, but I was asked to take a third year because of my visa status. So most of these fellowships is typically two years, as you know, the T32 by Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality by ARC. But I didn't have a green card at the time. So my green card interviews were, was gonna happen the third year. So I took that third year off and my mentor, Dr. Mary Charleston, actually said, you know, we'll support you for this third year, but we have to take you off of this NIH grant so you can actually, because you don't have a green card. Each fellow is assigned the primary and the secondary mentor to guide our projects. So in that third year, my primary and secondary mentor actually advised me to write my grants. So I wrote a care award 
um, I wrote an arrow one because at the time that arrow one actually um, was actually very important. And it was, it was a grant that was based on an RFA that came out of the NIH. And then I wrote a diversity supplement and a foundation grant all in that, in that third year. So the tips I'm going to tell you about when I was a fellow has to do with being open-minded and forging collaboration outside of your shop. What happened in this third year in my fellowship was that my interest, go to the next slide please, maybe I have that there. So my research question as a fellow was to explore the impact of patients' beliefs on medication adherence. My mentorship committee, which comprised the division director and the two primary and secondary mentors advised me against this because they said, if you focus on medication adherence, there's tons of studies that have looked at that and there's nothing new. Why don't you focus on self-efficacy instead of medication beliefs? So I did that, which means I had to actually change my entire orientation because my own interest was looking at the health of black folks with a particular focus on hypertension. I'd seen an 84 year old African American man in my hypertension clinic who often come to a clinic when I'm there every week, but he never took his medications. And when I asked him why you keep coming, you don't take your meds, he goes, because I trust you. I just love to talk to you. And I said, but you have to take your medications. He goes, I don't believe in them. If I believed in them, I won't be 84 years old. So that struck me as weird. When you look at the data, BP control in blacks is much worse than any other group in the country. So I realized quickly that patients do have beliefs about their medications and what can we do about it? But my mentorship committee felt that question was a dead end. I needed to focus on a behavioral model that can actually allow me to better address that research question. So we chose self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a concept that came out of the social cognitive theory by Albert Bandura, who was at Stanford at the time. And the issue was that his premise was that if you look at behavior change, there are, there are three factors that actually explains how well people are motivated or adopt a given behavior. One is the nature of the behavior itself. Two is the environment in which that behavior is going to occur. And the third factor is the personal factors that actually motivates the person to want to achieve that behavior. And the particularly strong one is self-efficacy, which is people's judgment of their ability or their capacity to achieve a given outcome by engaging a particular behavior. I had to review 800 papers. I would never forget. I thought, you know, I'm not sure why I'm doing this research. I learned everything about behavioral models, but guess what happened? I developed the only medication adherence self-efficacy self -efficacy scale in black hypertensives. And because I was open-minded to what my mentors asked me to do, that particular scale formed the basis of my first R01. In that third year of fellowship, an RFA came out, that's a request for application. I was asking for interventions to improve hypertension control in low income and minority populations. It was as if that was written for me. But you can imagine if I didn't do those three years, and if I didn't focus on self-efficacy where we had to use behavioral models, I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten that grant. So I got my first R1 in my first year. That instrument today has become my claim to fame. Why is it my claim to fame? Because it's been translated in, in five different languages, Arabic, Spanish, of course in English, Turkish language, Chinese. And so that's how I define myself now, a behavioral scientist with a particular focus on interventions to improve medication adherence in black hypertensive patients. Next slide, please. Forge collaborations outside of your shop. I met at the time and later became a protege of one of the influential leaders in hypertension, Tom Pickering. I'm sure for the, for the doctors um, in the audience, the physicians, you all know what white coat hypertension is. Tom Pickering was the person that founded that concept. I had my first grant writing experience by working with him on an NIH proposal. Um, because his group was the only behavioral cardiovascular research group at Cornell. And at the time, he was also the president of the Society of Behavioral Medicine. And so he introduced me to all the prominent leaders in the field of health psychology. I mean, I'm a physician. What do I know about these things? Well, working with Tom's group allowed, to see, allowed me to see 
um, the audience out there and the folks who can help me to take my career to the next level. It was through that collaboration that I was invited to join a study section, even though I was an assistant professor. I'll advise you not to do that, but I did it anyways. And, and that actually helped me to grow in the field of behavioral medicine. Next slide, please. Next slide. <clears throat> so after my fellowship, I was retained at Cornell. Um, of course, I had my first arrow one. I didn't know what the tenure track was. Apparently, I was on one. I didn't know until I was about to leave Cornell two years later. Um, and I hired my first research assistant with that arrow one. And in my second year, we received a second grant. I was now a PI on a sub project on a center grant that my mentor had developed. They wanted a population scientist that would work on adherence. And then I got invited to the NIH study sections. I joined the NIH behavioral medicine study section. I worked on all kinds of workshops to become the expert panel. All of this allowed me to begin to forge collaboration with folks outside of my division. Remember, my division was the division of general internal medicine. And I was the only expert in hypertension. It just wasn't enough. I had to work with people who knew more than I do. Next slide, please. So I stayed in Cornell for two more years after my fellowship and then Tom Pickering left Cornell initially for Mount Sinai in New York City and then for to Columbia University. So I, he, he recruited me and I joined this group on a tenure track. That's when I knew what a tenure track was as an assistant professor. I spent five years there on faculty. We wrote numerous grants. Each faculty on the tenure track had to maintain 95% of their salary on NIH grants. I received my second RO1 in 2005 three years after my first one. Continued collaboration with Cornell at the same time. I did not, I did not, I did not, you know, cut off that relationship. And the tips of what I'm going to talk about next is how do you manage transition when you leave one shop to go to another shop? Understanding the business of research, knowing the rules of the game, mentoring others and practicing resilience. Next slide, please. So transitioning. Transitions are very typical, they're typically stressful for both parties. Mentors may view this as a departure or as a loss of investment, sense of ungratefulness, in some cases betrayal. You've got to stay positive, but you've got to remain focused on your decision to leave. You have to master your mood. Remember, it's not about your, it's about your career, not about your emotions. And that's what I learned very quickly. Um, do not engage in bad mouthing your mentors because it's a small world out there. And so what I learned was that I was actually isolated from every division um, faculty meeting because I said I was going to leave. But you don't leave immediately because your, your grants don't get transferred. So it took me about six months um, for me to leave. And in that six months, it was pretty stressful. But ultimately, I left. Um, next slide, please. When I got to Columbia, I was ignorant of the tenure rules while at Cornell. And I didn't know the business of research because my mentor there actually protected me a lot. My chief um, of my division called me and said, Benga, um, give me a five-year, I need two documents from you, a five-year business plan on how I plan to sustain my funding. The second document should be a self-rating of my chances for tenure with respect to my publications, my grants, my teaching, and my national recognition. I drafted an individual development plan, which I think most of you know about, and I sought mentorship to address the gaps in my areas of weakness. I established an informal group of mentors outside of Columbia. Remember, I joined study sections, I met people in social society of behavioral medicine, and I began to form my own informal mentorship. Next slide, please. Here's what an IDP looks like, but I'm not going to waste your time on that. You can look at this later on. It allows you to figure out what your weaknesses and what your strengths are. Next slide, please. And so I inquired about the minimum funding criteria in terms of the business of research. What do I need to do to advance at Columbia? I continue to collaborate with colleagues, um, lending my expertise on their grants so I can get some percent effort to support me because you can't support 95% just on RO1s. It's tough to get one of those, but you're gonna need about five to maintain yourself. So I served as faculty on fellowship training programs as a mentor to enable me to recruit fellows. And I served on thesis dissertation committees for PhD students to enable me to get free research assistance um, from, the, from the students. I registered for and I attended every career development program that I ever, 
that I could lay my hands on. Um, and I attended every workshop at the NIH to talk about NIH funding opportunities. I thought that was important in order for me to learn the business of research. Next slide, please. Resilience is a necessary ingredient for managing failures. Well, the requirement of 95% of salary meant I had to write a ton of grants. And at the time, it was during the um, Afghanistan war, um, the NIH budget was flat. and was only 15% funding rate. I had to write five grants to get one funded. It hurts when you get your first, your first feedback. Remember, I just finished my fellowship. I was writing my papers. They were getting rejected as well. I got one that was rejected six times. But you just have to keep practicing that resilience. I also learned to deal with negative messages. So mentors who deliver their messages in very blunt ways and others in often negative ways that you may find offensive. I think it's important to look at what they're telling you. There is usually some truth in those messages. And I learned to turn such messages into strengths by actively deliberating upon the advice given me. My wife was a major resource at the time because I know she would tell me how it is without me having to figure out whether or not she's trying to BS me or not. Resilience is also crucial when dealing with manuscript rejection and other scholarly activities. I quickly learned that we get rejected for career awards, for grants, for manuscripts. But when you begin to react, to the feedback you get, you just become a better scientist for it. At the end of the day, discovery doesn't just happen overnight. It takes time. And smooth sales don't make for skillful sailors um, because you've got to build that character. And that's what resilience helps you to do. Next slide, please. So after five years at Columbia, I realized that I needed to do my own thing. I went for my tenure review as my mid-career mid review, my fourth year, supposed to be seven years, I was told, I probably won't make tenure. I'm a clinical scientist, and it's not clear that I can become tenured, despite having two RO1s and becoming PI on another funded project, um, which is a center grant. My publication, I have to admit, was in that stellar at the time. So I asked, what do I need to do? I was told I needed to establish a robust research group, and I have to have a self-sustaining outfit. So I left Columbia. I went to NYU, where I was recruited. Um, I joined NY in 2008 to, to launch a center for healthful behavior change. I have to tell you a story. When I went for that interview, I was actually bluffing. Um, a friend of mine called me and said, look, you've come to come interview here. You're doing such great work. We think you'll be a fabulous addition to our, our new division of um, internal medicine. You have to understand when you go to an Ivy League school, you wear a certain badge of honor that I think now it drives me crazy. I don't know why it's a badge of honor. You're bringing in 95% of your salary in research grants. You're on the tenure track. And here's NYU asking me to come to NYU. So I told the chair, I said, listen, I don't think you guys can afford me. If you want me to come, give me a center. He looked me hard for 10, 15 seconds and said, done. I was like, uh-oh, he called my bluff. I, I wasn't ready to leave, but when he said done, I quickly realized that, you know what, if people value me elsewhere, I've got to take them on. So that matters a lot. So I left Columbia, went to NYU. I had to establish that center. I had to mentor the next generation of junior faculty in health services research and transitional behavioral medicine. So that was being brave, mentoring others. I took my postdoctoral fellows, two of them, I'm one of my research assistants, and I departed for Columbia, I mean for NYU. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, no, previous slide again, please. In order to be brave, um, it was hard to leave Dr. Pickering's group. He mentored me tremendously, one of the best mentors I ever met in my life. He passed away now. So moving to NYU was the boldest career, boldest move in my entire career. The division was new, little NIH funding. I was doing well on the tenure track. I knew what I had to do to make my tenure in four years time. I had a solid IDP. I had a writing group that I just set up. I was in the midst of my second R01 at the time, actually the third one. And I just received a good score on my third R01. And I was just selected to join the NIH committee that sets hypertension treatment guidelines. So life was good. I became a permanent member of a study section at the NIH. So 
I, I, to live where you are and then move wasn't that easy, but it was a brave one. Next slide, please. The first set of core faculty I had were my former trainees and fellows. I applied for a mid-career development grant because I was now associate professor on the tenure track at NYU. And I received that grant. It got almost an excellent score, a score of 15. And I think that was largely based on the number of trainees, both junior faculty, postdocs, fellows, residents, and grad students that I've been fortunate to mentor over those first five years. The same criteria was essential for the future training grants that I received either alone or with other collaborating folks. Next slide, please. Full circle, 12 years later, I built one of the largest research groups in my department. I led the large division in my department. I launched a new section for global health just a few years ago. I'm now being asked to create an institute for excellence in health equity across our entire NY Langone Health. I served as founding vice dean of NY College of Low Public Health, is now a school. Up until recently, I was associate VC for academic networking across our global network programs. Next slide, please. Final thoughts and lessons learned. I think it's important not to take things personal. It's hard to do, but it's important to understand that. You've got to focus on your integrity and values that brought you this far because your success is not an accident. You're here not because of some fluke. You're here because you're truly successful. I love that it's important to be transparent in all your activities. You've got to keep your mentoring team apprised of your research activities. Be collegial with your colleagues because you never know when you need them. Every time I moved, I call my colleagues across the country. And I tell them, I, I share my contract with them and they give me advice on what they think I should be doing and vice versa. Next slide, please. So here are the important mentors in my career over the 20 years I've been in this business. Brenda Aiken um, steered me towards research and its importance for a successful academic career. Although I quickly learned that getting an MPH doesn't mean you become a scientist. After my fourth year at Columbia, I realized I didn't know anything, but it, does, it piqued my interest. Um, so I could apply for my fellowship. Bill Guerin taught me the art of grant writing. Um, Tom Pickering um, taught me selflessness and the importance of investing in mentoring trainers and junior faculty. Mary Charleston was my mentor at Cornell. Um, she taught me the power of finding passion in what I do and the foundations of research methods. Remember, I did not say the passion. I said find the passion. Be passionate and finding passion are two different things. John Allegrante taught me the art of work-life balance broad-mindedness and taking risk. I think, next slide, please. Whatever you do, dedicate time for fun and remember your family. Um, next slide. So here's my family, um, uh, three boys and my wife um, provided me unfettered support and very much believe in me. That's the only group that doesn't criticize me as hard as my colleagues do. And the only group among my peers who provide me only positive feedback because that's important. Um, and so I thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions.